What's up, everybody? It's your boy Marsman here, and welcome to Marsman Gaming. In this video, we break down the biggest gaming news topics of the week, and alongside with me is the Marsman crew. To my left is Haki. Hey, guys. And to my right is Langello Kill. What's up, everybody? So if you haven't seen this series before, basically we cover the biggest news of the week. And like I always say at the beginning of the show, sometimes there's always going to be some crazy news topic that happens right outside of the recording. And it's only for unfortunate for us that we can't do it live in front of everyone. But at the end of the day, I think the key thing is that we're going to talk about the biggest topics that involve gaming, whether it's game, gaming adaptions, game, video games itself, just gaming news in general, and just some opinion stuff that happens. So let's just jump right into it. The biggest topic that I wanted to talk about this week was going to be the Witcher 1 remake. And essentially, CD Projekt Red had confirmed to IGN as well as others that they were going to be making a remake of the original Witcher game, and it will be open world. And it would be similar to what we saw with Witcher 3 Wild Hunt, and it will also be recreated in Unreal Engine 5. Now, the old style basically had it where you would be going level by level, and you'd be limited to the specific area in which you are going to be in. Um, and this was made in the early 2000s. I believe 2007 was the official date. But obviously you're going to be getting a completely redone game. And essentially kind of start from scratch and make a, an open world title that now will be kind of comparable to Witcher 3. And, and a lot of its gameplay and mechanics. And I think it seems like this is the next game on the docket for them. Because I, knew, I know that they are starting the, the development of their witcher 4 if that's what they're going to call it um and i know they're adding more dlc content to see to the cyberpunk uh 2077 but it's it seems like this is what's next up on the list because they already said they're already in development and you know when you look back at the original game it was an 81 on metacritic back in 2007 the big question i want to ask you guys is do you think this is a smart move to make the original witcher an open world game and frank i'm gonna go to you first what do you think about this man well, I'm mixed on it. I think, again, we're kind of reached where a lot of, uh, we're getting a lot of remakes nowadays from a lot of game companies. And um, I do like that it kind of sounds like it's going to be a new game. Um, so they're remaking Witcher 1 and creating this open world aspect. And if they create, it has, you know, similar dynamics as Witcher 3, I think it has great potential. Um, and I do think it's will allow people to enjoy Witcher 1, which um, feels like, again, 15 year old game. So it's not too recent where it'll be too nostalgic. I think it'll be a new experience, especially if they create an open world game. Um, so I do like that aspect. My not so great feeling I have is this is going to push the new Witcher trilogy down the road. Um, I don't think they have the kind of manpower to do cyberpunk DLCs, Witcher 1 and Witcher 4 all at the same time. So um, unfortunately, I want to see the next Witcher chapter. And if they're going all in on recreating Witcher 1 into an open world aspect, I think it pushes Witcher 4 down the road. So that's kind of, you know, there's good and there's bad. And, you know, that's why I'm a bit mixed on it. Yeah. So, I mean, the, I mean, that is kind of a, a good question, too. What does this mean for the future projects? Um, and Haki, what do you think about this, man? Yeah, so um, I I haven't played The Witchers yet. I I, I just got uh, I just got the PS4, right? So I got got a lot of gaming to do. Um, but you guys have, have told me that uh, you know the game and the series itself is a very good game. Um, a lot of these games now are going to the open world because um, it has been successful. You know, in the last few years, definitely. So um, if the game stays true to um, to itself, and you know, it can pull all, uh, off an open world like it did with Witcher Three. Um, you know, I, I think it could have some some great success. But again, to piggyback off of what uh, Langelikil says, it's going to push a uh, new development back or something that that already started working on. So um, I think the fans would like it, but I think the fans are still looking towards the future. They want to see that new game. Yeah, see, I, I think I'm in the same, a similar boat at least. I think this is a smart move to at least bring. If you're trying to bring a new game in the series in which we're four. I, it seems to me that they're trying to at least take their time and figure out what they want to do with this game before they, they push it out. I think that's kind of the, the smart thing. It's been obviously some years since Witcher series has been you know in, intact, and Witcher still has a lot of popularity to it, clearly by what we see with the Netflix show, and, and everyone's itching for another game, or itching to see Geralt again. And, and in, that new trailer didn't really give you the indication that you would be following Geralt, right? I think that's kind of the main point. 
is that technically I think you're supposed to be following Siri, right? Based on what the trailer says and that the pendant is not Geralt's pendant. Like it may it may be a story with about Siri and maybe Geralt will be in it, but it's not it may not be a Geralt story. And then they kind of made that kind of like a hint at it being not really a Geralt story. It could be a, a new whole new story that's without him. And and I feel like Geralt is a legendary character and you kind of have to bring in one of those games that will kind of re reignite the fire, especially with the weird news about you know Henry Cavall not returning in which the the next se uh, after this current season that's being posted as uh, season after season four, I believe. Like you know, you need some some momentum, and I think remaking Witcher One, which was you know a good game for sure, but you you re update that with some some Witcher Three mechanics. You're gonna get like an amazing game, and I, I always said that they that sometimes they can do that with with classics and redo them in a more modern take, and I think they would be working out very well. Like I thought to this day, if you remake a Metal Gear Solid Three in a, in a way that you play Metal Gear Solid Five, The Phantom Pain, I would literally think that would be the best game ever. Like I think that would be the best story with the best mechanics for the, that series, and I think that when you do that with with Witcher One, you're gonna get a very good game because Witcher 3's mechanics were just so well done, right? And and I do agree with you guys. Like, it does kind of put a sour taste in your mouth that that just means that the Witcher 4 is way down the line because they, they have all this like planned DLC expansions with Cyberpunk, which they should because that game has good potential, but it's just like they bu they butchered the launch of the game so badly that you need to it's like you have to rebuild this, this popularity again. And it seems like they're doing okay at like bringing people back, but... It needs to really give some story DLC with that game. So they, that kind of takes the priority. And then I think that Witcher re remakes a good idea, but we do need to see some new installments. Um, I will say this to piggyback, you know, they did a kind of a press conference talking about the new Witcher 3 updates for next gen. And there were some interesting tidbits in there. Um, they kind of, you know, like the, the head uh, producers of them talked about, Hey, do you guys want to work, go back to working on Witcher? And you know, the, CD Projekt Red employees, their workers were very excited about the Witcher thing. And it almost kind of felt like they're not as excited about doing um, Cyberpunk. And so it was really interesting. It gave off a very weird vibe talking about kind of the game, current games that they have and working on more Witcher stuff. Um, so I don't know what that kind of deal is, but it, I, I would recommend people to go watch it because it did have some uh interesting little tidbits and going back to the witcher one it has to create a vast world you know it can't just be some you know gameplay mechanics and you know updated graphics i think that would kind of fall a little flat for witcher one i think it has to be a legit open world game for it to appease the fans to be quite honest i, I don't think it should be like some of these other game companies who are just remaking them and, and updating the graphics no, no I, I mean, I don't think that's the case. I mean, when they say there's going to be an open world game, because the, the first one wasn't at all an open world game. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I think when they said that, it seems like it's going to get the Demon Souls, like, kind of treatment, which I think would be fantastic for Witcher 1. I think you redo the game. Like, you don't have to change the story. You can keep the story the same. But, like, let's redo the game and its mechanics and how it plays and the, the, the open world aspect with side missions. Like, what you had with Witcher 3... Put that with Witcher One, and now all of a yeah. sudden, now you're gonna get it. And you already know if it if it succeeds, then I can guarantee you Witcher Two will then be remade because yeah. it's because everyone likes to remake everything. Because Witcher Two was a fantastic story, and and it, yeah. there was an open world, and it was already amazing. So you know you gotta you gotta have if one works, you gotta do for the second one too. Um, but that that was way down the line. Um. But anything else before we move on to the next thing, guys? I'm ex I like Witcher. It's more yeah. my favorite series. Witcher uh, yeah. Four. Witcher Four. Again, we don't know about the Geralt thing. Um, I think if you could play as Siri and Geralt, similar to what you did in Witcher Three, I think that's a home run. But we will yeah. see. Um, we'll we'll see. Siri's a very good character, so I'm not against. Yeah, I'm not. Listen, the when they when when I heard that at first, I thought <laughs> when the first trailer for, for the Witcher Four came out, I thought they when they said hey, it's gonna be a new character. I was like, um, you're going to start, you're going to do a, a Mass Effect Andromeda on us. Like you're going to bring a brand yeah. new character and then it's going to be trash. Like, is that what you're telling me? Yeah, like, but then I found out that it was dependent that Siri had. And I was like, oh, okay, that is okay. Like Siri yeah. is another great character in that, in that story that it's okay for her to have her story yeah. as a continuation because it makes sense. And I, I would but be I happy do want with it. Geralt in the game. I don't of want course. I mean, Geralt yeah. is a great character. So I, I'd be 
You know, I'd be upset if he wasn't in the game, you know? But, yeah, so I, I, I feel you there. But let's move on. This is a, a special report. This is an exclusive from Max Everett from a colleague of mine from Vendetta Sports Media. This is exclusive. Nobody else has this. He, he kind of did all of his research here, got some inside sources, and he wrote this article for the site, and I'm really, I'm really proud to be able to work with him. So uh, this is the, this is the article that he posted, basically discussing about Resident Evil Three had some, you know, I issues with its development, some things that were cut, and also some, some, com somewhat controversy with this outbreak expansion mode. And uh, let's 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 take a dive in here. Basically, according to his recent report, Max Everett had stated that, you know, I think it's a well done article, by the way. I think he's keep tossing praise his way. He had discussed uh, some some general topics revolving around Resident Evil 3 and, like I said, the Outbreak expansion. In the report, basically, there are several sources that had discussed how Resident Evil 3's development had some issues along the way, obviously. And, you know, it was happening around the same time as Resident Evil 2's remake. So there was a lot of problems that were, you know, the fact that they're coinciding at the same time. They weren't necessarily prioritizing any, you know, all resources to one game to making sure that it was done. And then the other one to get the same, the, the same treatment because Resident Evil 2 remake was very, very well done. A lot, had a lot of good you know praises for it. But Resident Evil 3 remake didn't get that same thing. And, and when you compare the two, they were drastic. It looked like the 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 end result was completely different in how they were received and how the game ended up being. Now whether this was due to the issues of the development or they just tried to speed through the cycle, it seems that. Fans were not really like excited or happy with the end result of the game, resulting on a 79 on Metacritic and a 6.6 .6 user score on Metacritic, which is pretty bad. I mean, granted, I guess some people are going to review bomb it, but to a certain extent, Re Resident Evil has never really been the review bombable games. Uh, usually, they're pretty safe from the the fanboyisms that we see in a lot of other you know popular titles. Um, but in the article, Max states. That the development project, what they call Project Resistance, which was supposed to be a four-person multiplayer-based game similar to what we see with like Left 4 Dead and Back 4 Blood, essentially the article states that Project Resistance was supposed to be a separate title, um, uh, and and it was supposed to be a separate title, whether it was going to be a remake of Resident Evil Outbreak or a brand new title on its own. But due to the outcry that this game, uh, you know, had in its trailer. It basically became an expansion of Resident Evil 3, basically making it into a multiplayer mode. And sources close to the marketing side of the game state that, and this is quote, Resident Evil 3 was always on the way, but perhaps we could have taken longer to flesh it out if not for the negative reaction to Project Resistance. Essentially, based off of what people looking at trailers, the the, the devs seem to be, and this is this is based on obviously the, these inside sources on, on on marketing, based on what they said that they were afraid of the outcry that these trailers looked pretty bad. And if you can go check out the trailers too, you can give your opinion on them. But the trailers didn't look great. And so the fear of all that backlash forced them to have to speed through this game to get it out to make people happy to see that it's done. But in the long run, it didn't really do that, right? Eventually, people didn't really like what they saw. And essentially, uh, you know, it shows a few things. It shows, shows first Resident Evil 3's development was extremely extremely rocky and due to some you know events happening it became an ultimate failure right so i think the overall question here is what do you think about the story and and do you think that resident evil 3 should have been let like kind of let the bake a little bit longer instead of just rushing out early and you think maybe it would have a better result and i'll jump into this one first i honestly i, I think this this story is very interesting i think the fact that these sources um you know they they basically paint a pretty clear picture like the fact is you know, Resident Evil 3 was working and the grand and this happens, you know, when there's, you know, a, a big company like Capcom has the ability to work on multiple projects at the same time. That that's not a bad thing. I think that's normal. But the the fact that literally there was a Resident Evil 2 game came out one year and nearly a year, one year later the next Resident Evil remake came out. It seems that they were trying to speed through the process of making a game and essentially they failed on a lot of this cut content that they had. And then they just bailed on this this four person multiplayer game when, you know, granted, like I'm not saying like, oh, it would have been a great game because the trailer didn't really look great when I watched it either. But the point is, is that because of outcry of a trailer that was solely just cinematic had no gameplay shown, it was people didn't like it. And they said, all right, we got to speed through this thing and combine it, and make it a multiplayer mode and just just get this damn game out. 
right? Because now they're begging, they're they're hoping and praying that the next Resident Evil remake, which is Resident Evil 4, which is considered to be one of the best or the best Resident Evil game out in the market, the remake for that is going to bring their fans back to their side. And I think that just now puts more pressure on that game, right? If you were to let this bake a little longer, make sure that all the cut content you had stayed in the game because they literally cut levels out of the game they changed the, the nemesis they turned the, like they made the main one of the main villains of the game the enemies you face in the game just not as good as what we saw in resident evil 2 and now you just have a half-baked game that could have been a lot better right i think that is what the sad part of this is and and that's why you know i, th I think there's a great article because it shows a lot of those you know things that not a lot of people know about now granted some people might have had a guess when they saw the end result and were like what the hell is this you know why is there all this cut content but it now makes sense. Like if you if you're a big fan of Resident Evil, you're like, why did this game not end up being what I wanted it? Here you go, right? I think this kind of lands right on the mark. So talking about remakes and fans of remakes, hockey. I know you're a big fan of remakes. Uh, what do you think about this story? I know yeah, just so I mean, as being sarcastic. I know he is not a fan, but <laughs> what do you think about this? And do you think Resident Evil Three remake should have stayed in a little longer to let it at least finish on the right path? Yeah, yeah. So um. Again, I think speed kills when it comes to this type of stuff, especially if um, uh, you know you don't put out a full game when you have such a great fan base and, and such a large fan base. Um, we've seen it now a lot. Um, either you know half of a game coming out um, and then things being added on later. Um, you know you have a good base. You know Resident Evil. Uh, it's a good game, good series of games. Um, if and, and like you had said if the um resident evil 2 came out the remake came out and then just a year later resident 3 came out the remake you know there, there there was something wrong there you push it back six months push it back a year get the multiplayer right um again you have a good fan base just you know give them a game that they'll like instead of putting pressure like you're saying putting pressure on your next remake that uh you know now there's a lot of pressure and hopefully they can they can come out with something good yeah, I, I completely agree with you, man. Langelica, what do you think, dude? Yeah, I mean, we've seen this a lot recently. Um, you know, game companies want to get out games, especially remakes, as fast as possible. And uh, this was a very forgettable remake. Um, two came out really well. Three is very average. And so, you know, it, it's interesting when these articles come out and these information comes out, usually you find out afterwards when the game is. And we, we saw this. Um, with Halo, we saw this, you know, with with multiple other titles on what went wrong after the fact. Um, so another interesting uh, article here, kind of showing the development of three. But now, like you said, it brings a lot of pressure in four, which is one of the biggest games in Resident Evil series. And now all eyes are on how this remake is going to come out in, which is coming out next year, um, or supposed to come out next year. So we got one year, one year, one year from from two now to four. And now it makes you a little bit nervous on what side are we going to get a Resident Evil 2 type of remake or a Resident Evil 3 type of remake for 4. Um, so there is definitely a lot of pressure here. Yeah, because here's the thing. When you compare Resident Evil 2 to Resident Evil 3, technically, when you look at Resident Evil 2, it's uh, I think it was around like six or six to eight hours in, in duration. I think Resident Evil 3 was six hours. But Resident Evil 3 remake had multiple stories like it had two perspectives that you're playing through the entire game right I think that's why it was it seemed like you're doing way more things in that game title versus Resident Evil 3 which not only cut content from the game that was in the original and then you just it just seems like you just kind of whitewashed everything to just make it simple and just fast and it, it, that just ruins the vibe of what the game is usually when you do remakes and kind of one of my basic I guess rubrics of a remake is that if you are taking the exact copy of a game you should honestly be able to at least add some adjustments or add something to it though that it's not just an exact remake you're like hey congratulations we just copied and pasted it in an hd version and there you go like you know do something whether you're changing the gameplay mechanics or you at least you're adding like another level or some side missions something like at least read like final fantasy 7 remake like yeah you know i'm a little upset that they divided it into three separate games which is which is mind-numbing to me right when is it when all of it was in one title the first time right but you want to divide it into three this time just because you want to give me want to make more money whatever but at least they gave you side missions and they redid the combat 
and they did all this other stuff for Rest of Final Fantasy VII Remake that makes it feel like there's a lot of things that are different. I'm not playing the exact same game back back in the day, you know, like I have my own gripes for remakes, but like at the same time, like I want to see stuff that's like added in, you know, like that's just that's just basically what it is, you know, like that, that's just how I feel about it. Um, and <laughs> that's so they better they have to now land on Resident Evil uh, 4 remake. They have to land. If they don't, then it's just a failure, right? People are going to be extremely upset yeah. if Resident Evil 4 remake is right. just bad. You know what I mean? So let's let's hope. Um, so let's jump to the next story, and uh, I like to call this the Law and Order fanboy unit. Um, basically, this is following the the Activision Blizzard deal, but not we're not going to talk specifically about the deal because we've mentioned it several times on the show. And I'd rather not even go into a speculatory, you know, discussion because we don't really have any sort of answers yet. Right now, it's it's discussing what's going on in, in the UK regulators and they're they're giving out all these different, um, you know, arguments of why, you know, Sony is the greatest company for Microsoft saying Sony is the greatest company I've ever seen. And we are horrible in every single game development we do. And Sony's saying, well, if, if Microsoft gets this game, then we're going to crumble in an instant. Like, both are lying. Both don't make any sense. But the one thing I do want to talk about is because of the kind of the fight that's going on here, there was a story about how the the deal about Activision or really Call of Duty staying on multiple consoles for, for a specific number of years. Because remember, Call of Duty right now has three years left remaining on its contract to stay like every single year in the remaining three years of a Call of Duty game dropping on Sony as well as obviously on Xbox, you know, but the contract, this one specifically for Sony. And so the fear that a lot of Sony fans have is that if Microsoft owns Activision, then essentially they control after the contract's over how the negotiation process of what would happen next. And so basically it seemed that based on reports, Jim Ryan wanted to have a, um, a somewhat eight-year plan and you know the original proposal was that Phil Spencer wanted to give a five-year plan and obviously you know that was not adequate according to Jim Ryan but recently it seems that that Phil Spencer was talking I believe to The Verge and he had stated here that um, and this is a quote here that the idea that we would give uh, write a contract that says the word forever in it I think is a little bit silly but to make a long-term commitment that Sony would be comfortable with Regular, uh, comfortable with regulators would be comfortable with. I have no issue with that at all. And it seems that he is his proposal would be 10 years as a contract extension, but he didn't want to add the word forever to it, um, which makes sense because you that's just the you know, it's a word saying for the forever, like you know, like it, it may it makes sense to give a number because usually contracts that's what they do, they don't just make it like a life contract because you know, who knows whether Call of Duty can even survive 10 years. Like, let's let's be real. Like, call as much as I know it will, but it's like, Call of Duty's had some bad games for a decade straight sometimes. So, you know, like, that's, that's happy. So, it's, that's, un, that's not unheard of. But what it tells me, though, is that this, this seems that if Microsoft, based on what he's saying here, and according to a lot of reports, if Microsoft does buy Activision, the plan that Phil Spencer has is to actually expand Call of Duty's reach to be not just between Sony and, and and Microsoft, but to also go to Nintendo, which was part of this this side you know information here, which would be interesting because I had never can't even imagine Switch being able to handle Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Um, but uh, but the ultimate goal, and I think if people don't realize this at this point, I don't know what you're what you're looking at. The ultimate goal, what Microsoft wants to do is add Call of Duty to Game Pass, right? That's what the goal is, right? I don't think they're looking to to take away Call of Duty from Sony. I think their goal is to put it on Game Pass because now you're giving people an incentive to buy Game Pass, right? Um, so I'll ask you guys, I have two questions here. First question, do you think this deal eases the regulators' issues with this acquisition? Because I think that's essentially why Phil Spencer put this out to the public to tell regulators and to tell Jim Ryan, I am open to play ball and extend the contract if you guys ease the F off, like kind of deal. So Angelic Hill, what do you do you think this is his you know, do you think this is enough to ease the regulators, you know, fears here? Well, I mean, we gotta be honest, right? It started with just it's gonna be three years, then it says okay, maybe five years, and now we're hearing ten, right? So obviously 
Microsoft wants to get this done. So you know that there is some, we're hearing about FTC probably suing Microsoft over this. We know the UK regulators are kind of holding this up, although Brazil and the other ones have kind of, you know, let this go through. So it's kind of being held up in Europe. And so I think the, the whatever will get this deal done, um, Microsoft will probably want to do, whether it's 10 years, 12 years, they don't want to do it forever, which makes sense, but they're willing to kind of go a long-term plan if it's going to kind of ease the tensions between Sony and the regulators for this deal. Um, so I think it's, it. again, they know a lot more information than we do, and they can probably feel whether the regulators are going to go which direction. So I do feel that if Sony sees the UK is going to be okay with the deal, I think they have to take the long-term deal, right? I think it'll be a win for Sony. Even if Activision goes through, it'll give them at least a decade of Call of Duty staying on Sony, um, and it will allow them time to potentially develop their own FPS shooter. So um, I do think it'll be a win for Sony. It'll be a win for Microsoft, but I think this is going to be a long thing that battles that that is going to fight out through the thing. And I don't think Sony is going to accept anything unless they know or have a feeling on kind of where the FTC and the regulators are going to go. I think if they think they're going to squash the deal overall, they won't accept the deal, obviously, because they won't have to. But if they feel that it's going to go through, then I think they accept that long term deal and and we move on. Yeah, I, I can feel you there. Hockey, what do you think, man? Do you think this eases the tensions with these UK regulators? Yeah, so I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's three times what they were going to do in, in the first place, right? So I think um, their Xbox is given a little bit more, you know, Microsoft's given a little bit more. Um, and just like Langelic Hill said, um, 10 years is, is a good amount of time to develop your own game. Um, and again, how many Call of Duties are going to come out in the next 10 years if they continue to put one game out per year? That is a decent amount of, you know, Call of Duties uh, that, that'll at least will be on um, the PlayStation servers, uh, you know, like like we're saying, just for, for a decade. So um, I'm thinking that if I'm thinking that if 10 years works, this deal goes through and then, you know, we, we see what happens after that. Yeah, I mean, like that's the thing I, that I was going to add that is that just because they say 10 years doesn't mean they can't renegotiate the contract and add yeah, more years yeah, here. Yeah, you know what I mean? Or, yeah, like, they, 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 like, could, they could always do that. And yeah. Yeah, because to be honest, and I said this multiple times in, in several videos, Microsoft, I don't think, is looking to risk losing this deal completely. Because if this deal doesn't go through, they actually have to pay a fine of like several million dollars to like to like let it go through. Because they have to, like, it was like, they, it's actually a weird thing. They have to pay a fine because they basically led, they brought the uh, Activision shareholders along with them this entire time, and they, you know, they didn't get the deal go through. But I think that Microsoft wants to get this done so that they can add it to Game Pass. They're not looking to to make this exclusive. Now, granted, I think if they did, that would be pretty big, but I don't think they are. I think, honestly, they realize that if they make this exclusive completely, then the regulators are, like you saw with the FTC, they're like, oh, they're, they're ready to sue. If they made it exclusive, that's what would happen. FTC would sue them immediately, and then they would basically break apart Activision and, and start handing out you know assets to different companies, and then you would be just a, a grab I don't, yeah, that would basically be what happened a bunch of these game companies would just start buying individual studios and then all of a sudden that's that's how activision would die right it would basically just disintegrate and then companies would just handpick which studios they're picking up to add to them to their to their pockets right and that's that's essentially what would happen um but i don't think I, that, I think if this deal doesn't go through they, to be honest they, they should the break loser, it apart they should the big, they, they the should big just loser, destroy activision and, and the, the big that. loser is activision so yeah. a couple million dollars to Microsoft is like no, it's not me, me handing out a couple singles to to one of you guys. No, I'm just saying. I, I just think that I think I think Microsoft doesn't want to just like lose out on this no, deal because. No, but the biggest loser would be Activision, right? So that would be the number one loser. It wouldn't be Microsoft if this deal doesn't go through. Yeah, Microsoft wouldn't be happy that it doesn't go through because, like, like you said, this is to bolster Game Pass. Um, so it wouldn't be happy, but the big loser would be Activision. Uh, and that would be the huge loser if this deal doesn't go through. I think I think if they did that, then Activision would be broken up into several pieces, and then all of a sudden you're just going to get a mad grab of of companies, these big the big boys buying out these smaller studios to just add to their pocket. Man, I think that would if, if anything that would be 
Yeah, that would eventually what would happen to them. And I think that would be, I mean, I don't think that's necessarily the worst thing either yeah, because that's, not necessarily because that's just basically just means that you have a bunch of independent studios that make yeah. their own games and now you're like, you're adding them. And, but then you might fall into the same thing. Like, all right, then what's the difference between Microsoft buying a bunch of studios that Activision owned, right? Yeah. It's the same thing. It's just, that's why I, I don't necessarily think that that would, you know, yeah, but it wouldn't them. be, you know, it, it is a little different. Yeah, you're, you're not owning every studio, yeah, but you're you're owning. You're, you can still buy. You can still buy infantry. Work. You can still buy yeah, Kray art. You I mean, like you could just buy the big boys and just be like, "Yep, we're just adding these big boys here, the big studios, and just leave the smaller ones, like Raven Studios, like let them let them go sit over there in the corner because they, they can't make they, they can't make games. Um, you know, let them be over there making World War uh, Call of Duty World War Two. Yeah, I don't know where side. Activision would go. I mean, they would have to have new leadership and. Like that. That's why it would be. They'd have to start all over, you know. Yeah, it would be. A huge, they would. Yeah, it would be. They would be done. I mean, even Blizzard. Yeah, like be. Blizzard. Blizzard. Blizzard's part of it too. You yeah. know, Blizzard literally would then. What would happen to them? They would have to. They would literally have to start from scratch. What would happen to their studios? I mean, that that's a big deal, right? Microsoft's it, it, hope is, and they talked about it, is by mid year of next year. Yeah, that's have this settled, the and then like you know what they. So their goal, their long, goal is to play as, to their their goal is to play as nice guy as possible, yeah. and uh, and basically give everyone whatever multiplat they need on Activision yeah. con and Activision Studios, Overwatch everything possible, and to basically just you know like like let it go. They just want to have it on Game Pass so that they can keep adding more because we are, we know what the plan is. Why what why is Game Pass the way it is? They said it in these documents that the reason why Game Pass is the way it is is because they want to use this ser this service to make money back for the console losses that they have, right? That because that's essentially every every game company loses yeah. money on consoles. Microsoft's plan to make the money back is to make Game Pass as as highly subscribed as possible to then make up the losses so they want to put as many of games they own on it so people buy it right and eventually they'll increase the price which will then make them more money more profit that's what's going to happen over time but to even get to that point and to kind of the second question here i think this is a quick one do you do you think phil spencer's telling the truth about keeping cod on ball plats i don't think necessarily he's telling the truth on every single thing but i i don't think he's necessarily lying that he's gonna keep this on all plastic because i don't think he can make it exclusive right now i think if anything at the moment at least for the like be that 10 year span i think cod's gonna be on all plats because they they have to, or else the fdc is gonna sue them right if he had the ability to like in 10 years later on and the fdc cools off and he says well we're gonna make future cod games exclusive to microsoft i could see that happening especially you know with the, the recent reports of him saying we're gonna ex we could extend it to 10 years like that means he realizes that i can't make this exclusive right now especially how hot this is. and after the, and they, they make a contract you guarantee you can't make it exclusive during the contract but what yeah. you can do is do what, what what sony does where you make exclusive content within the game solely to your console like that's what sony's done with call of duty for years because their main player base is call of duty so they're gonna get like special skins special map exp like or whatever this stuff that's what Xbox is going to do, right? And, I, and and they're going to do that with... They used to do that with the old Call of Duty. Call of Duty 2 was actually a big, like, Microsoft like used to do that all the time. Um, but they'll do that. I mean, that's that's what I think. Do, do you guys think that he is telling the, the truth about keeping COD on all plats? Uh, Angelica, I know you. I know your answer, I feel like. Well, no. I mean, you can't take everything that everyone says in public to mm -hmm. be truthful. I, I, I don't like, trust Phil Spencer at all, but I, I also think he's not... He's not I don't think, I think he's he, blatantly like I, I, don't I don't think, think it was, was his like, intention early on like it's kind of like these half truths right when he comes out and says no, I'm not making it exclusive but like for three years he can't right but the question would be saying, when saying, the contract comes up after yeah. three years he can't he can necessarily say I didn't lie to you and make it exclusive like yeah. I originally didn't but now contracts up I will right so I don't blame Sony trying to strong arm no no I, I get getting that 10 completely. years Right. So you want to get it on, you want to get it, you know, on paper and like, you know, Spencer saying like, Hey, I want this to get on Nintendo too. That all sounds all nice, but we don't even think Nintendo can, can handle with their current maybe, online system. Maybe this was their um, hint of uh, switch is finally making a, uh, a pro a switch pro finally maybe that's maybe, what it means i don't know maybe phil knows he's got insider maybe he's got inside I, my, my only thing that i'll clarify what i was saying before i'm not saying i trust phil spencer to like hey can you go date my daughter like not like 
I don't trust Phil Spencer to that degree, but I also think he physically can't. Like that's the thing. Like it's like, yeah. do do I think I'm trusting him? Like yeah, it's gonna yeah, he's gonna do it because he's such a nice guy. No, yeah, yeah I yeah. physically know he can't make it exclusive For because the contract, whatever there's a con contract yeah. because yeah. the FC FTC will sue him and they'll just sue him. Again, I don't does. know the rules after the deal goes through that they can sue. But it's like, it's about it's but that. yeah, but that's my point though. You see how they're po they're poisoning themselves to say, hey, we might sue because it seems like they're trying to make it where uh, if there's prior contracts signed that say we will not make it exclusive for X amount of time, that's when they'll be like, okay, we're good. Right? We're not suing you because technically you're giving them plenty of time, like Sony, plenty of time to make a game, come up with a plan, like all that stuff. Because that that's the argument is that. This happened like when the news dropped that Microsoft was buying Activision, it it did catch everybody off guard. Like there was no rumor. Well, yeah, I mean, there, there you know, was, all that and stuff. Then, and there was never, no there was never a hint that this purchase was like happen. this in tech. Yeah, and or, ever and, and and essentially Sony was kind of like we only have three years left on the deal, and yeah, we have to now come up hard. with a plan, yeah. and we have to try to like we need FPSs now, right? And and essentially. I think by giving 10 years, you are giving plenty of time to now at least come up with a plan. And my hope is that Sony realizes, hey, we have good IPs. We have good studios that can make games. So let's invest in making an FPS that has a story and good mechanics. Because your all your other games are great stories with great music and art styles. Make a gun, make an FPS game that has good music, good story, and art style. And you're already going to be on the same level, if not, on popularity. Right? Now, call, granted, Call of Duty people just buy Call of Duty just to have it sometimes. Like, because Call of Duty sometimes can be frustrating as hell. But, mm -hmm. but like, you can make it, if you make a story game that's great, that's a, that's an FPS, you're getting into, le like, great FPS games then, right? Like, as much as Destiny had some up and downs, Destiny 2 is doing very well. You know, as much as Halo Infinite had a crappy launch, the Halo series have had great games because of story and music and gameplay right if you yeah, have that you're gonna have I, a full I think following I, but i want to get hockey's opinion on yeah this. Go ahead, um, yeah yeah hockey oh, yeah, what do you so, um, what do you think about this man yeah so um what i think is like you guys are saying probably a little bit of truth and, and a little bit of lie in there but um what i'm thinking is that whether it's gonna be three years or ten years it obviously does go on game pass right we know that's the the main focal point but maybe it goes, or maybe there's multiplayer um, and the story mode available to, you know, PlayStation and then either just Warzone for the Xbox users, you know, having that exclusive or having, you know, having Warzone as another thing that someone on PlayStation can purchase. I don't think they're going to, I don't know if they'll ever completely take it off of PlayStation because like we know a lot of people on PlayStation buy yeah. the game every single year. So I'm thinking they're gonna obviously put it on Game Pass, but they're probably gonna still let you know the the PlayStation platform either buy it or have something exclusive like Warzone only for Xbox. I still think it would be. Yeah, to That'd be honest, be I think if anything, to be I honest, think I think I think, there's, I think I think the campaign has now become the third most most popular. Right, yeah. you make yeah. you make the story exclusive to Microsoft. I mean, that would yeah. be even like too. That. But yeah, I, I do feel you. I think no, I, I think, think Warzone and multiplayer are like too synonymous with. Yeah. with more so many people that they just like you can't make exclusive i think story at least then you can make the case like well how many people actually play the story right now great i like the story i play the story but but you know how many of those of the it's sony the third most popular yeah, it's the third most popular so i mean you can at least yeah. make the case with that you know but yeah um anything else guys before we jump to the next thing so uh, no more fanboys no more go. fanboys let's do this <laughs> no more fanboy unit um Next thing we're going to talk about is Nintendo shuts down the biggest North American tournament for Smash Brothers, and we're going to talk about some reactions to it. Um, so first off, Smash Brothers World Tour is a major Smash Brothers tournament and, com and competitive circuit that has been unexpectedly shut down. The Spanish, uh, Spanish, say Spanish, the Smash World Tour championships were basically set for December 9th in Texas with many of the top Smash players basically buying airfare and getting sponsorship ready and then travel accommodations ahead of time. And instead, basically because of this whole thing, they basically are, you know, they, they're, they, this, there's no event that's going to happen all the way until at least the entirety of 2023 circuit. Like there's not going to anything happen in, until le at least deep into next year. And essentially the organizers of, of this tournament 
which were basically a group of just fans that were unaffiliated with Nintendo, say that Nintendo told them without any warning that they would no longer be able to operate the night before Thanksgiving. And essentially, the organizers said that they will be losing hundreds of thousands of dollars due to the shutdown. Basically, in response, Nintendo had talked to, you know, the greatest uh, news news group ever, Kotaku, in stating that the company had uh, did not request any changes to the Smash World Tour in 2022 and that this dispute was solely uh, about the upcoming 2023 circuit. But they say that there's some very, you know, opposite perspective, like one side saying one thing, the other side saying the other thing. But what is kind of consistent here is that we've seen that Nintendo has been extremely shaky when it comes to supporting esports, and this has been pretty consistent. So it's really unclear which side we have to look at. But what we are seeing though is that there's going to be that there's a group called the it's called Panda Global, which is looking to make themselves the sole, like almost a like monopoly on these esports that for Smash Brothers and other Nintendo events. And there are some speculation that this might be kind of like an inside job because you know panda global is a uh is out is a, a japanese based company i from my recollection that it might be their connection to nintendo that might be driving them to be that monopoly but i could be right i'm a little unsure about the, how close that is and that's obviously speculation here but the question i have for you guys is when you're what's your opinion about this entire incident you know who should be more at fault in your opinion should it be nintendo should it be the you know Smash Bros World Tour? Should it be Panda Global? What do you guys think? Um, I'll I'll let Hockey go first on this one. What do you think, Ben? Who's your Who's the most at fault here? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, you know pointing figures going on. So we don't really know exactly um, what happened, um, but I, I think it might fall a little bit on uh, Nintendo. Uh, you know. I don't know why they're against esports. I mean, esports has blown up uh, in the last decade um, a, a whole bunch. So um, I'm gonna think it's a little more on Nintendo. It kind of sucks that you know the kids that that paid airfare and, and had high hopes of either winning money or just competing. Um, yeah, they they gotta fix it because again, Smash is the uh, probably the best multiplayer game on Nintendo. You know, so or, or one of them. So it's an important game to the fan base, um, and it probably could have a pretty cool um esports um you know following as well so yeah and what's crazy is that they have smash brothers have had a lot of great esports tournaments yeah. like in the past right and and you have like games like splatoon that is also a great esports game so you have multiple that are like that and now this is a situation but angelica who do you think is more at blame here yeah it's nintendo um they're always heavy-handed on everything that they do whether it's you know content creators uh, reviews on their their games um, events like this, you know, they're very brand protective and sometimes they can come off as very heavy handed, uh, when they make decisions. And this is kind of feels like another example of it. Um, whatever the issue is, which doesn't feel to be very clear, um, to just shut down the event, um, at a, at a whim is just excessive, you know? So I don't know what the exact reasons are. It feels like this would have to be a huge reason for them to just destroy the event instead of maybe potentially misunderstandings. Um, but again, we won't really know for sure until more info comes out. But based on the info we have now, I, I think this kind of falls pretty heavy on Nintendo. Yeah, I feel like Nintendo should take the brunt of the blame because they're the most powerful company or in, in, in group involved in this situation. And they have the complete ability to just say, no, this is fine. We're having the tournament. We'll, we'll, we'll help you out with organizing or you know make or it you clear this, yeah or you, you gotta do that. this you gotta do this just to get the tournament going something like that they can easily do that right uh, you know smash uh, world tour is just a bunch of fans that essentially made this up on their own because of their love of the game right and whether i know too much about panda global or not i mean the key thing here is that they they're just taking the advantage of the situation i mean that's just literally what it is so i'm not gonna say they take the blame because they're just being the group that steps in and says, all right, there's no tournament, then we'll step in and we'll make one ourselves. You know, granted, they if they have the support of Nintendo or not, who knows, right? That's that's kind of the key thing. But Nintendo is the one that is the revolving around this whole thing because people like, you know, you want to keep legendary games like Smash Brothers alive. The franchise is alive, right? Like, that's the point. You want to keep them alive so esports is the way to do it. People love Smash Brothers. You got to keep yeah. that stuff going, right? That's kind of maybe you're right about the panda stuff, and they've done this with content creators. They give green light to certain content creators, who you know they make sure it's not going to be too harsh on their stuff, 
and you know they do similar stuff could for their events right they're not very open to a lot of people whether it's creating content for their games or you know pretty much holding the banner for their brand so that's the very concerning part i hope that's not what what that what this is i hope that panda thing is not what it is because then it kind of follow an ugly trend about nintendo handpicking who can represent them yeah that'd be unfortunate i just think that nintendo should be better than that if that was true that would be that'd be pretty messed up um so anything before we move on guys i think i think we kind of covered everything the last story of uh of, of the night of this of the video is the new smash uh, i was about to say smash was new super mario bros movie trailer had dropped during a nintendo direct which was officially yesterday and uh you know when you look at recently uh, illumination studios who is the same people that work on uh the minions series and everything so they're very good at animations they you know based on all their all recent successes but i think i've, I've kind of grown tired of seeing another minion commercial ever again but you know what they're they're killing it when it comes to the they're like up next to pixar when it comes to the level of how good animations look and, and movies and things like that so Illumination Studios had uploaded a new trailer of the Super Mario, uh, Super Mario Bros. movie. Essentially, this showed a lot of updated visuals. It was only like two and a half minutes long at most. Um, and it showed some possible story components for the movie. We saw some introduced characters like Donkey Kong was right in the very first scene. We saw depictions of Yoshi's at Yoshi Island. We saw Peach, a lot of Peach in this one, a lot of Toads. Uh, we saw footage of Mario driving some Mario carts along Rainbow Road. So, you know, basically, if you're a fan of Mario, you would probably love the trailer because you're getting a lot of those little, little nuggets of references to video games that you've played over the years. And I could literally pick apart every single scene. And I was like, all right, they're going with the Smash Brothers opening against Mario vs. DK on like Final Destination style. Um, like it's, it, and then they like go right into like, that is like just basic games. I'm just like, oh my God, they, they're, like, they're going into everything here. Um, and what's interesting, I think I find the most interesting thing about this, it seems like this is like an origin movie of Mario because it shows like the discussion of like how he and Luigi became into the Mushroom Kingdom where it shows them like clips of them being plumbers, like literally being plumbers, which is their basic story that was made a long time ago when they were first created. And it's like, you know, if, uh, you know, before Mario became the legend, before Mario and Luigi became the legend, you know, they were plumbers. And it seems like if Nintendo is checking off, should we consider this game to be, you know, to be lore? Should we consider this movie, to, this, this, this Illumination movie to be Mario's backstory, official backstory? Because getting checked off by Nintendo, the, they have the okay. And I was like, wow, I never seen them use this plumber stuff in a movie before. So, I mean, other than the crappy one that, came out in the uh, in the 90s but I, I don't even want to speak about that one anymore but does this trailer give you excitement for or, or really excitement or fear for the actual release of the film officially in april not that far away and i to be honest i want to give my opinions first on this one i'm a big oh big mario fan me growing up i wanted to be mario and they asked me what do you want to be when you grow up i want to be mario that was my that was my goal so watch think some of this trailer i was sitting here like this looks fantastic i was like sitting here like the the, the look, right? Mario looks great. Like, I was sometimes you're a little scared. Like, you know, when they first showed the pictures, like, Mario's got no, got no donk, and you're like, dude, what, what, why, like, what's going on here? Like, what? Mario's got no ass. Mario's dude. got no ass. Like, what's going on? Like, <laughs> I can't hide, man. Yeah. I, I'm like, what's going <laughs> on? And, no yeah. And, and so, you know, like, some of those things got you concerned because you're like, this doesn't look normal. But some of the trailer stuff, like, literally looks great, right? I think the, the voice actor for, I mean, Jack Black playing as Bowser does a great job. I think he he kind of lands it like on boy Bowser would sound like if he was speaking more normally. Um, Peach sounds just like Peach. Like I'm, I'm, I think that's a good job for that. Um, DK, I know technically, I think it's supposed to be, I think it's supposed to be Seth Rogen. I think doing DK, which which is like, I I'm like I had I didn't hear anything from it. So, but I'm like, DK looks good. I mean, DK actually looks like DK. They try to change a little bit, but he actually mirrors the original DK look, so which is why people were like, "Oh, I'm actually okay with it." Um, but I, I'm still kind of a little like annoyed about M Mario not sounding Italian at all. Like I think, I mean, like you're hearing, like you're hearing that that Chris Pratt's trying to use some cool, some lines, right? That Mario would say, 
No, he tried. No, but like he, you can tell he does like the line. At the like end. The, the no, at the beginning. No, at the beginning yeah. he did. The beginning he did too. He said, "Oh, let's he said, go." Here he's we like, go. Let's, no, he's like, "Let's yeah. go." Like trying to like calm himself down. Like, "Let's go." I'm like, <laughs> I'm sitting there like, dude, like you, you keep me Italian accent at least. Like, give me something. Yeah. Like, because like, dude, you, you, the look, it looks great. Yeah. Even Charlie Day as Luigi, I'm like, dude, that he, that is, makes sense. Like, I can lay, I could see him as Luigi the way he talks the way he's like scared like that makes sense like Chris Pratt is a great actor you can make your voice sound a little different dude no one's gonna be mad at you for making a somewhat Italian accent that's what the character is and that's what I'm afraid of because I'm like so far I've watched two trailers of the Super Mario Bros movie both of them looked good with what they showed me but the one thing that was consistent was the fear of what Chris Pratt's voice is going to do to the overall feel of what the movie is. It's like it gives you that feeling that this movie could be great. It could be great. But because of the little things like that, it might sour it enough that it's just going to make the movie OK. Right. And it, that is what makes me upset because I think this looks like a good concept. Like they're making an origin story movie about super mario and you're bringing in all the worlds combined have to fight bowser that's what the story is going to be it's going to be they got to go all these different worlds recruit the champions of all the of all the worlds to come help them fight against bowser and the kingdom they're going to get dk and his con crew they're going to get peach and all the toads you're going to have to go to yoshi's island to go get yoshi's to come help you out go to the penguin place you're going to all these places to go fight bowser in the end and and i have a, just a bull take I got. I feel like Mario beats Donkey Kong in that fight, and it's gonna shock everybody because that's like Toad's like fucking. I'm like, yeah, we just beat him. Like, I feel like Mario beats him, and everyone's like, oh my god, you like this guy. Uh, in the trailer, he was getting slapped around. He was. No, he was. Oh, yeah. I think in like the the bold take is that yeah. they showed you him getting slapped around, but yeah, he's gonna yeah. like make a comeback and win, and everyone's yeah. gonna be like, yo, like this kid, this guy just beat our champion Donkey Kong, and then everyone's gonna be like, yo, we gotta follow this guy, and then that's how they're gonna build more people around him. Which would be a great story, which uh, but like the bottom line is, Mario doesn't sound like Mario at all, right? That's that's the fear that I have, and I I I am excited for what it looks like. I think it will probably be the best Mario Bros movie we've ever had because they've all been horrible, right? But you know what what standard are we holding then, right? That that's the point. Like I want it to be the best, and it looks like it could be very good, but there's some fear there about this voice acting choice could do to the overall outlook of this movie right um langella kill i want you to go first are you more excited or have fear based on this second trailer that you saw i'm mixed on it and i gotta say the visuals like i agree with you the visuals actually look really good um i think they did really good what we've seen so far with the animations I love that they are bringing in multiple characters, although I was a little disappointed not to get anything out of Wario or Waluigi. Um, we did not see any of that. But I love having multiple characters like the Kongs, you just mentioned Yoshi's Toads, and, and hopefully we'll see some more. I know we saw some boos at some point um, in the first trailer, not so much this one. But, you know, I, I like that. I think actually Jack Black, Bowser, in the two trailers that I've seen so far, He's the one that I think has done a really... I, I've been more impressed with Bowser than any other character that I've seen. Um, they, with as Luigi, like doesn't bother me as much as what Mario is. Mario, in the two trailers that I've seen, is just Chris Pratt. Like It doesn't even feel like Chris Pratt is trying to be even somewhat Italian. It's just it's like Chris Pratt talking. And that doesn't mean it'll destroy the movie because you know what it kind of reminds me with the different styles right art styles but the lego movie and you know that ended up being a pretty underrated movie to me um i wouldn't call it great but it was an underrated movie and i feel like that kind of is the the ceiling of this mario movie that it could hit um even with you know but again the lego guy is different than mario so like chris pratt can be the lego guy and there's no one that's an eye right but being mario you kind of like it's almost getting to the point where why even put Chris Pratt as Mario if he's not going to even attempt, right? Why don't you just get any, you know, Italian speaker or the original Mario, uh, you know, voice, you know what I mean? So like, if he's not going to give more than what we've seen, I did see a little at the end when he, you know, like, Yo! like, yeah, yeah, the like, Yahoo thing. Like, I was like, know, like I, I can recognize it. Like, little, that, that was okay. But like, it was a little smidge. 
But everything else was like, damn, this is just Chris Pratt talking. Like, it's not even somewhat an attempt. And that, I think, will hurt the, the overall movie, which kind of feels like you could see some good in there. So that's that's kind of the big concern for me. Yeah. Well, Hockey, what do you think, man? Yeah, I'm just piggybacking off of what you guys said. I mean, I think we're all in uh, <clears throat> in agreement here. It, it looks fantastic. Um, you know, seeing all the characters uh, as well is uh, really cool. Hopefully we do see um, a few more. Um, like when Angelica said, Bowser, uh, one of the coolest characters. And I did like that we saw DK and, and Mario kind of uh, get into a scuffle there. Uh, but yeah, the, the biggest sore thumb could be Chris Pratt uh, as Mario. Like when Angela Kill and, and Marsman said at the end there, that little Yahoo got, you know, sounded a little bit. saw a little light on it. Like, you know, just it, a tiny bit. But yeah. it's got to be all that. And if it's an origin story and they're going to make another one, if this does good, and another one after that, you better learn how to do an <laughs> accent. Dude. Just a little <laughs> Just imagine, just imagine how crazy this would be. Like all of a sudden, like let's just say he does the he does the Paramount Plus, where the entire movie he doesn't sound like an Italian at all, and then by the end of the movie he like gets hit in the head or something. Like oh, oh no! Like you're like oh my god! I'd be, I'd be like yo, come on, dude, what are you that doing? Be That'd be so stupid if <laughs> you did so that. Stupid. I would literally be so angry. Like you're you're just screwing me right now. You I know just mean? Wanted, like, like effort. Like I just felt like just, I didn't, just make it trailers, a slight, I saw, like, a practically zero effort. Give me a tint of Italian in there. Zero. Not even like yeah. asking to be Rocky full Garden on like Alex. like yeah. straight up Italian off the boat walking into yeah, like, New York City style. Like I'm not yeah. I'm not asking to be that that Italian, but I'm asking to like, give me a tint. Like because everything else, you know, looked great. I thought like even like when you saw like Mario's about to go fight DK, you like you were like, all right. Like he gave like the serious look, like I'm gonna I'm gonna go fight. Like he wasn't like because that was my only fear with some of the things I saw was that Mario Mario like looked like, like he was like oh yeah like the Lego does. guy is like a nobody. They're kind of making Mario to be like this under yeah he's he's like a like he's a guy who knows around. nothing who gets yeah. he gets beat yeah, up a lot like, he gets yeah. beat up a lot he gets smacked yeah. around a lot and he's just getting and he is the ass of become right and that's the thing like that's yeah. whatever that's fine because it's a story like Mario's he's a plumber like it, the whole story. And, and I said this to you guys off stream. I'm happy that this trailer told me that I was wrong, right? I, I was right on what the concept was where they got sucked into Mushroom Kingdom. Like, I was right on that part. But thank God they proved me wrong about the whole possible real real person. And then they get transferred into the Mushroom Kingdom and then, then they become cartoons. That's where I got fearful because I was like, dude, it seemed like that was what it was going to be for a minute there. But... You know, like I, that's fine because it, then it like turns into that. You know, Mario's gotta you know save Luigi, right? Luigi's you know been Bowser's castle. He's got to get all the other champions of the different kingdoms to come help him. And you know that that's a cool thing because all the little nuggets they dropped in that trailer gave all Nintendo, you know, specifically Mario fans, like something to be like, I know what they're referencing, right? And when you saw at the end and they did the Rainbow Road, I didn't even expect that, and I was like. That's a cool reference. Like that's a good Easter egg. Everyone's driving their cars like it's like Mad Max style, driving their stuff right across the Rainbow Road to go fight off against, like go fight Bowser. Like, dude, that's a cool, that's a cool like concept. And honestly, like if they made a Mario game that was like that, I, I'm sure it'd be a good Mario game where it was like. I, I'm a, rooting. I'm rooting for it because you know, I'm rooting for game adaptations to be successes. Yep. And that if they stick close to kind of what the lore is, that it works. It's Sonic. Right, because then it'll yeah, then it'll again prove to Hollywood people, show people yeah, that you can do it. Get closer to the lore, you can do it. People will like it. So I'm I'm really rooting for it. Similar to Last of Us that's coming out in January, you know, like I want that. I want the Marathon movie to be a success because you, yeah, for it to prove that don't think you're smarter than everybody. You know, like you can make some changes. Obviously. This is not like there's a book of Mario that tells you exactly how this story went down. Like yeah. they're gonna take nuggets from all the games, they're gonna create their own little story here. But like if it works, it shows you, hey, you know, you can maneuver this and it could be a success. I agree. And and I I really want this to be successful so I don't have to write another add on to the, the horrible gaming movie list that I've already compiled from a while back. So yeah. Yeah, so listen, uh, that's going to be it for us, guys. I do appreciate everyone that came out to watch. If you haven't done so yet, hit that thumbs up and subscribe for more future content. And please join us on Twitch. We do our live streams daily, and we are really stream almost every type of genre of game from all platforms. So, so go definitely go check us out there. We reached affiliate recently, so would appreciate that subscribe and follow on there. 
Join us on social media, on, tw on Twitter and on Discord, and that is located in the description below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join us on Patreon. And that is also located on the description below. But until next time, this is Marsman from Marsman Gaming signing off. Peace out, guys. Thank you.